This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. Colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. 31 books, 18 edited volumes, over 300 articles, 40 plus doctoral dissertations, and 33 external research grants between 1961 and 2004. While numbers certainly do not qualify a research professor, these numbers certainly make Professor Albert Waldman Rudy Professor Emeritus of French, Italian and Linguistics, and Director of the Creole Institute at Indiana University, the most accomplished linguist specializing in French, Italian, and French-based Creoles of all time. Professor Waldman received his PhD in 1960 from Cornell University, and he has worked as a professor at Indiana University for most of his distinguished career. He served as chairman of the Committee for Research and Development in Language Instruction, director of language instruction in the Department of French and Italian, chair of the Department of Linguistics, and director of the Summer Institutes for Haitian Creole Bilingual Teachers. <coughs> Professor Waldman is founder and editor-in-chief of the journal Studies in Second Language Acquisition and the French Review. Among his numerous distinctions and accolades, he holds an honorary doctoral degree from the University of Neuchâtel, the Palme Académique of France, 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 and Quebec's Order of Francophones in America. He served as secretary treasurer of the American Association for Applied Linguistics and president of the International Association of Applied Linguistics. He was president of the American Association of Teachers of French and a founding member of the Comité International des Études Créoles. <coughs> Professor Waldman's research interests include Creole studies, especially Haitian Creole and Louisiana Creole, second language acquisition and teaching methodology, and French in the Americas. He held Guggenheim, NATO NSF, Fulbright, and Senior Fulbright Fellowships. His publications include several hundred, artic hundred articles and seven books devoted to the topic of Creoles alone. Le Creole Structure Statue et Origine, Theoretical Origins in Creole Studies, Historicity and Variation in Creole Studies, Haitian Creole French English Dictionary, French and Creole in Louisiana, a Dictionary of Louisiana French as spoken in Cajun, Creole, and American Indian communities, and Haitian Creole English Bilingual Dictionary. As a former field worker and a proficient speaker of Haitian Creole, Professor Waldman worked on the standardization of Haitian Creole, notably on its grammar and spelling system in the late 1980s, which gave him valuable insights into Haiti's national language, past and present history and culture. He recently inaugurated the Haitian Creole Studies Program at the University of Florida, where much as today, he spoke to a diverse audience about Haiti's unique language. We are honored that in today's lecture, entitled The Language Issue in Haiti's Economic Underdevelopment, he has accepted to share with us his expertise on the role of languages in the local and global development of Haiti. Please join me in welcoming Professor Albert Waldman to the University of Illinois. Thank you.
There is a Haitian proverb which says, Dayeman Gaman. In back of mountains are bigger mountains. So in back of me are many, many bigger mountains uh, who have worked in the field of clear studies and of course of Haitian culture. And I'm delighted to be back at Illinois uh, where we have uh, many former students and colleagues and uh, distinguished scholars uh, who, to whose memory I'd like to pay respect, uh, really giants in our field, Wilger Rivers, Braj Kashru, uh, Henry Kahane, and so it's delighted to be uh, in this university that uh, they helped to make famous. Uh, one begins uh, in Haiti, any presentation by saying, Messi dame la société, on est. And you should respond, respect. respect. Now we can begin and talk about uh, is to address a topic that was broached by the distinguished geographer and anthropologist uh, Jared Diamond uh, right after the disastrous earthquake uh, uh, in Haiti. Uh, in which he was asked, uh, is uh, Haiti poor because they speak Creole, which is not a world language. So this is part of a topic I will address. It is, I'm sure that uh, as you listen to all the uh, news about Haiti uh, after the earthquake and now after the election, uh, what comes, the first cliche or first statement is Haiti is the poorest country in the West Hemisphere. And of course, as you look at these statistics, it's quite clear that 80% of the population lives with less than $2 a day, half of only $1 a day, 55% uh, in extreme poverty, and 70% uh, without fixed uh, income, which means unemployment, and the literacy rate, which still today is only about 50%. When Cookie Roberts uh, asked Jared Diamond, uh, the, uh, what is the difference between the Dominican Republic and Haiti? And actually, one of the cliches, uh, if you travel about Haiti, is when you travel to Port-au-Prince, on the left side, it's all green, that's the Dominican Republic, and on the right, gray, uh, eroded, it's Haiti. So the contrast between these two countries that share the island is striking, and of course the reason is why Haiti is so underdeveloped and poor, and although the Dominican Republic is not the most opulent country, yet uh, it is twice as wealthy, at least, as Haiti. And Jared Diamond gave a right answer, and he said, a little geography and a lot of culture and history but then Ms. Robert let him down the garden path <laughs> because then she said, what role does language play in the disparate development between these two countries? And then he said, well, it's because Haitians speak a lingua franca Haitian Creole, whereas the Dominicans speak a world language, which is Spanish, which means that Presumably, this would uh, isolate that language is what isolate Haiti. Now, it's quite clear that you do not need, a population does need to speak a word language to become economically developed. The case of Japan uh, after World War II, and of course, Korea today, and many other countries, and of course, India and Brazil on the way. So. Uh, so clearly, it is not Haitian Creole that has condemned the Haitian people to poverty for nearly two centuries. It is, uh, and during that uh, interview, uh, Diamond then mentioned other reasons, and of course, the real reasons. One, of course, is that Haiti has consistently lacked enlightened leadership. 
uh, of the 45 presidents, half were victims of coup or assassinated. And uh, I don't think that one could be too sanguine about the result of the last uh, elections, uh, in which although uh, Sweet Mickey, carnival singer, uh, won by landslide, what the, men, the media did not mention is that the landslide, only 20% of the population, 20% of the registered of voters voted. Is that a landslide? So uh, I'm afraid uh, we have to wonder whether Haiti will be blessed with enlightened leadership. Uh, geography is another one. Uh, remember he said a little. Well, it's quite true that the Dominican Republic receives more rain, and therefore uh, its land uh, is more fertile than that of Haiti. But the real reason, of course, is history. The Spaniard did not develop a plantocratic system, a plantation system in the, in the Dominican Republic. They did begin to import slaves in 1503, but they used the Dominican Republic mainly as a staging base for the conquest in Mexico and in South America. But the French, uh, beginning much later, about 70, well, 1680, developed a plantation system which, with slave labor, which made Saint-Domingue, which was the name of the western part of Hispaniola in those days, the pearl of the Antilles, which produced a half of the sugar used in Europe and 25% of the income of France. But part of the plantation system was importation of massive importation of African slaves, which constituted the majority population, therefore, uh, with only 20, 40,000 Europeans who spoke varieties of French, uh, uh, clearly, the slaves never acquired French, which is a prestige language, and they created, developed a Creole. So, there is a, a language issue in Haiti, but it is not the fact that Creole isolates Haitians, and as we see, the problem, I should mention yet before I get to the language issue that uh, there's a problem of population, although the Dominican Republic, the surface of the, is twice that of Haiti, its population is slightly less. Uh, Haiti, uh, the last census, well, the last census, which of course is not most accurate, there are 10 million Haitians, uh, nine and a half million uh, Dominicans, but uh, Haiti has half the size of the Dominican Republic, and that, of course, uh, is a problem. That uh, it gets another thing that the media seldom mention the, uh, the growing population of Haiti with dwindling resources. The language issue, the problem in Haiti is that French is a vested interest of the elite who have maintained control over it, and at the same time have not allowed the population, 90% who are, speak only Haitian Creole, the possibility to develop human capital through the use of that language. So it is not that Creole isolates Haitians from the outside world, it is that uh, it is not possible for the majority population to use, uh, to acquire knowledge uh, with their native language, which is Creole. And at the same time, it is very difficult for them to acquire the Dama language, which is French. It's quite interesting that the Haitian peasants are aware, monolingual speakers of that state of affairs. In, the, in 1982, I interviewed um, a Haitian peasant, and he said something very interesting about the relationship between the languages, and he said, Francais, c'est pas langue pan, c'est langue achetée. French is not a language, it's a bot language. Well, what does it mean, bot? It's, well, you could say, because if you go to school, uh, you have to pay for it. Well, that's not what it means. 
you have to relate it to voodoo. In voodoo, there are two types of spirits. Those that you inherit, part of your lineage, and then those that you buy, acheté. So you have loi, acheté. So as you see, French is like the spirits that you buy. They are not those that you inherit. And therefore, they demand greater sacrifice and they can turn against you. And then he continued uh, to comment on the linguistic situation by saying, nous poco point dépendance nous, parce qu'il après indépendance nous, c'est créole pour nous tirer créa. Nous pas de servir à langue blanche. He said, basically, we made a mistake. After independence, we should not have used the language of foreigners, the blanc, but our language creole, and that was an error. So he, you see, this peasant understood fully the linguistic problem, linguistic issue in Haiti, the fact that French is not their language that you inherit, that you learn at home, and that our language, Creole, was not that uh, one that sh was used. It should have been used, but it was not used. So uh, today, uh, also, uh, a problem, of course, is in Haiti, a child of five years old who goes to school uh, is told that the language he speaks, that he spoke at home, is not a real language. And then, instead of using that language to acquire knowledge, he spends most of primary education trying to learn another language. And under conditions that do not make it possible for him to acquire the knowledge that he needs. So today, then, I will first talk about the linguistic situation of in greater detail. I look at attitudes toward an access, toward uh, the language, toward French in particular, and access to the language of a part of, the, of most of the population. Uh, I look at the school system through which, because in Haiti, there are two ways in which you can acquire French. Either you are born into the elite 10% of the population who are bilingual, or you have to learn it through the schools. So if the schools are to be providing the means to learn that language, then they should be functional. And as we shall see, uh, what, what characterizes the schools in Haiti is that they are totally dysfunctional. <coughs> then we look at the role of the government in education in both uh, literacy, briefly, and in uh, an education reform started in, the, in uh, 1979. And then I look at uh, the hope, some hopes of going forward from the present situation. What is Creole? Well, Creole is not a lingua franca. It's a full-fledged language born of a special situation of language contact. And that situation was the attempt of a part of the majority of the population at that time, during the plantation economy, uh, to acquire not the language of the court, of the written language, but that spoken by the European settlers, sailors, which was vernacular French, which differs significantly uh, from the French that we teach in classrooms. And uh, this was sort of approximation, that is, the early slaves when, let's say, they were match the population between the Europeans and slaves, acquired a fairly close approximation to French, but then later slaves learned it from those who had acquired an approximation, and then the approximation to the second, third, and fourth degree, which with time, Creole came to be very, very different from French so that the two languages are not mutually intelligible. So let's look at the situation in Haiti, which is a little more complex than simply French and Creole. 10% of Haitians speak French. In addition, that 10% speak a variety of Creole, which is somewhat Frenchified, which has the interesting name of Creole soi. Now, the term soi refers to Caucasian smooth hair. 
So you could see uh, that an analogy between the smooth Creole elite. So the elite has a double advantage. They speak French, and they speak a prestige variety of Creole. 90% of the population are doubly disadvantaged in that they do not speak French, and they do not speak that Creole. Then there is what we call a standard uh, Creole, which is basically that of the area around the capital, Port-au-Prince. Uh, there are some regional varieties, although there are not great differences uh, in the regional varieties of Creole. And then there is a rural uh, country bumpkin <laughs> uh, Creole, Creole, Creole Moon Mun, the uh, Creole of people uh, from the hills. So uh, the situation is a little more complicated than simply French versus Creole. There are different varieties of Creole, particularly uh, the Creole Soie, which is a prestige variety. Now, the question we could ask, is Creole ready to assume most language functions, especially education and administration? Now, we've seen that it is a full-fledged language. It's not a lingua franca. Everyone speaks some sort of Creole in Haiti. So we might ask, what does a language need to fulfill these functions? Well, the first, you need a systematic spelling, so you're going, you'll be able to write it. And then you need to use that spelling to, then you to have a relatively invariant norm. People agree on because you cannot have in written text highly divergent uh, varieties. And then you need to use that spelling in a variety of texts. Uh, you need to codify it. You need to have dictionaries and uh, grammars and so forth. And then the language has to have official status. So spelling. Well, uh, since 1945, before 1945, Creole was written as if uh, it were some variety of French using uh, etymological spelling, which of course made it very difficult for people to, uh, who speak Creole to be able to, to use that. So in 1945, in fact, there were not one, but three different fully acceptable autonomous phonologically based spellings. Unfortunately, the first one was put forward by Anglo-Saxons. Ten years after Haiti uh, was liberated from American occupation. You could see that the elite, even those who were sympathetic toward Creole, uh, did not appreciate that the people who would provide a spelling for the language were Anglo-Saxon, a Scot-Irish uh, Methodist Pastor McConnell and the American literacy specialist Frank Laubach. And it's interesting that spelling was used uh, to provide a transition to French. Then some Haitians who were favorable toward the use of uh, extension of Creole, unlike McConnell Pressoir, who was a writer and journalist, was a scholar who had discovered that in, 19, in 1872, a French judge in French Guyana had devised a very good spelling which used French conventions. And he simply adapted this to Haitian Creole. And that was used for 35 years until a group of linguists, that's the worst people you want to devise spellings for you, from not only that, not only linguists, but linguists from the university Descartes, Cartesians, <laughs> linguists, decided to play around and have a spelling. I'll show you what they did. And surprisingly, although the government had used the Haitian spelling the, for Bla Pressoir uh, in its literacy programs for 30, for, for 30 years, they officialized the one that the French people introduced. And that's interesting because here we have what is uh, the story of Haiti that is dependence on the outside, that the outside of the world make decisions. Now, uh, McConnell Labak uh, 
what they had available to them was a description of Haitian Creole by a Haitian linguist, Suzanne Sylvain. And of course, uh, as you know, you represent nasal vowels with the tilde. So for the uh, sound un, uh, they said, well, it turned out that in Port-au-Prince, the printers did not have a tilde. So what did they do? Great error. They use a circumflex accent with a population, an elite population, who used to writing French, you can imagine what you're using, a circumflex for some other value. For la pressoir, then they use one of the, uh, the spellings of in, in French, which is I-N, but they got into trouble, oops, sorry, they got into trouble because how then, if you use I-N for un, how do you write in? So they used, this is not very, pretty, the hyphen. Now this is where the French came in, and actually this uh, was much better. They used en, which is another spelling of en in French, and then of course, uh, en was built for en. What is interesting is, about that time, I was uh, meeting with Haitians involved uh, in normalization and work on language, and they were already beginning to accept the en before the French did. It's too bad that they didn't do that. So, so the French introduced, uh, what is the most ironic, of course, is the next part of this, the semivowels, where the French convention to write ou as in French what uh, is ou for, for the sound w. And McConnell, of course, had used a w then, and then uh, for yeah, when it was the beginning of a word, uh, pressoir used the wa, which of course you have a French in like, say, word like yacht or yankee, but before vowel, they used I. And of course, our friends, and it's interesting, the reason that the Haitians did not use W and Y, they called these the Anglo-Saxon letters. And what is ironic is when the French came in, they reestablished the Anglo-Saxon letters. And notice how they would write, instead of the French convention, they would use the Anglo-Saxon letter Y. And then what the French did, it turned out in a Creole, uh, when you have for a French word that has R, if it is before a rounded vowel like OU or O or O, in Creole, it's pronounced W, like the word for a dress, which is in French rub, in Creole, it's wub. But if you're thinking of a translational system where children have to learn to write first in Creole and then in French, it was not very wise to use that. There really is no basic problem in taining that. So the result of this is that the Asian government, uh, instead of using a very workable spelling done by Haitians, did one. And there was growing serious error that the, our friends for uh, René Descartes University did, which is, uh, if you look at this uh, in the pressoir, you notice a lack of symmetry in that the uh, sound for A is E acute and the one for A grave, but notice here there's no accent. So the French said, well, as, any, as good linguists, you need symmetry. So they use a symmetrical system in which we, they took the accent off in E, E, O, and O. The problem was when a child moves to French and he knows that the, the, the E, the letter E is E, he's, he's going to pronounce a French boule, boule. And then when you get something like this, he's going to say, je ne te le demande pas, instead of je ne te le demande pas. Grave error, uh, but unfortunately, Again, the Haitian government uh, have, they officialized the last spelling. Of course, everybody now uses that spelling. Uh, the differences are not that great. So there really, was it really necessary for French to come in and to displace a Haitian spelling? Uh, how about the norm? The, Creole soi, what characterizes that variety of Creole is that it uses 
the front routed vowels, which do not exist in the uh, folk creole. Uh, this is a speech uh, from Aristide, uh, the populist uh, president, and notice he uses e, uh, est-ce que, gain des bagailles. Also, he uses preposition in a standard creole. This would be est-ce que, gain bagaille, regret, regret, est-ce que, gain bagaille, regret, without these function was de and que, and do not, not using these front rounded vowels. Uh, and then, if, in regional Creole, I'm not going to spend too much time about that, uh, there are regional differences. The most salient is Northern Creole. Uh, the, uh, in standard Creole, the word for my cat is chat moin, but in the north, it's chat a moin, which comes out normally chatam. You notice that between chat moin and chatam, there are great differences. My neck, kumwin, uh, quam, my brother, frère moi, but frère homme, where they are appearing. So there are differences, of course, as you would expect in vocabulary, but the two the all varieties of Creole are mutually intelligible. So uh, who are the people who provided the standardized Creole? Not the government who had been involved in doing literacy work for uh, all these years. Not the French, but the people from the religious sector uh, who began to uh, publish material, periodicals, in Creole. Uh, Carrier Pot was a Protestant, Joyce Koypens, a Belgian, a Dutch-speaking Belgian, a Bonne Nouvelle, which still exists today, and Roger Desir, who was a translator of the Bible. And what they did, they did not use the prestige variety of Creole, which is very important. They used the, the of the basic standard variety, the one spoken by the average people around Port-au-Prince. So that was a great decision. So the standard, the norm for Asian Creole is not the prestige, the one that is spoken most widely. Now, to be, a language has to be officialized. And in 1987, uh, after uh, the at the Duvalier dictatorship, a new constitution was written which made a Creole and French. All Haitians are united by a common language, which is Creole. Creole and French are the official languages of the Republic. Furthermore, the constitution said, all documents and treaties and so forth and so on should be written in both French and Creole. And since there is Académie Française, why not une Académie Créole, which would be involved in the scientific and harmonious development of the Creole language. Now, let's look. This is fiction. This is a desire. This is official. Let's look at the reality. The reality is that, in fact, in official a Creole is seldom used in official publication. It's still French. The reality is that in education, it is primarily French and not Creole. Notice that uh, English is as present in education as is Creole. Uh, in the media, again, uh, notice French and uh, English a little bit. So despite the fact that Creole is an official language, the government and institutions have not followed the Constitution. They do not publish laws, decrees, and so forth in Creole. So this is still f uh, somewhat fictitious. So although Creole is an official language, it is not uh, in spirit. It is not a de facto, by law, it is not a de facto official language. That, of course, is a very important the relationship between two languages. Now we could ask. Uh, you know, Damien Jarrett said that uh, Spanish opens the world for Dominicans. Does uh, what opens the world for Haitians? Well, it is clearly Spanish. Uh, there are one million Haitians in the Dominican Republic. So, and if you want to study, 
Uh, you can go to Cuba, and the, the Cubans and Venezuelans provide a lot of support, many uh, fellowships and, and scholarships. And of course, uh, the immigration, of course, to the Bahamas, 25% of the population of Nassau is Haitian now. And of course, there are about a million uh, Haitian Americans in the United States. So uh, if you want to look the outside, then the languages that are provided is not French. However, despite the fact, if you're going to live in Haiti, which most of the population is condemned to do, then it is, I'm sorry, I'm not, as you could see, I'm a novice at this. <laughs> It is, it is French that is a means for socioeconomic and uh, social advancement. So that is the language that should be made available and accessible to, uh, to Haitians. And the question is, is it? What are the attitudes toward the languages? And uh, again, these are peasants that I interviewed. Uh, in the 1980s. <coughs> Notice, what is the language of Haiti? Clearly Creole. Uh, you could say anything you want only in Creole. Uh, which language is best to learn a trade, which is very important? It's Creole, not French. And well, that's very interesting. Which language is most useful for children? And notice where English is, right? <laughs> it opens a world. <laughs> for people who want to leave Haiti. And, of course, what is very important uh, is that to get a job, and notice here French becomes more important. Where does one learn French? Well, as uh, these peasants know, it's a school. And why do some children not acquire fluency in French? Insufficient schooling. And now this is very important. This was done in 1979 uh, as the reform was being discussed. I'll talk about this later on. Uh, is should Creole be used in schools? And of course, the answer is yes. So the peasants were quite uh, sympathetic to acceptance of the use of Creole in the schools as this uh, education reform was being launched in 1979 80. Uh, where do you use, now uh, one of my uh, graduate students did a study, you know, where do you, you hear French? Uh, it's on the radio, and notice even at school, uh, people were using both languages, and the only people uh, who never, uh, notice that doctors never use French. <laughs> this is, of course, very important, so Creole, is really the language that fulfills most functions for the average uh, Haitian, especially in the countryside. I'll skip that. Uh, I'll talk about education. Uh, no country can progress if its educational system is walking on crutches. And this very nice uh, Creole expression, fe uh, zukudap schools are faltering. Let's look at schools in Haiti and notice that this, these are the Haitian Institute of Statistics. I would say probably it's 30 percent of Haitian children do not go to school, 30 percent. Attainment of children five and nine only 35, 30 percent have completed primary school. If you look at uh, children aged 10 and 14, uh, still 25, 30 percent have not completed primary. And one thing you notice in Haiti is that many uh, in primary school, you get kids 15, 16, 17. And then high school, only 11 percent of Haitian children have completed high school, only 2 percent, less 2 percent education. So no school attainment, high dropout in schools. Now, schools. This will come as a shock to you, but, and again, the statistics are that about 80% of Haitian schools are private. Not charter schools, not 
private schools that you found in the U.S., which are the best, they're the worst. The term in Haiti, for, I would say 50% of private schools in Haiti is école borlette, lottery schools, which are for profit, that the people have schools to make money, and their quality is dismal. If we look at the infrastructure, this is a school that is not too different from the school I attended uh, primary school in France many, many years ago. It is not the sort of school that you went, those of you uh, attended, but it's still pretty good. It's in Cape Haitian. It's a school run the Sister of the Holy Cross, uh, tuition about $150, $200 a year. Oops, what did I do here? <coughs> then, we go 15 miles in the countryside, and what do we find? That's a rural school. And this is the inside of that school. Imagine what happens when it rains. And, and then, uh, this is a school, which is another rural school, a private, supported by American uh, a church group. And like, notice that this one is much better than the other rural school. However, like 91% of rural school, no electricity, like 70%, no water, and of course, no toilet facilities. And this is a typical class in this school, 100 children, okay? So what was interesting here is a, a minister went to a, a center outside Port-au-Prince with computers. And then, of course, the kids were eager to use it, but then what happened is, There was no electricity or internet, but there were computers. <laughs> so, of course, the problem, and of course, he said, well, uh, you should wait a few more years till you get electricity and maybe connection to the internet. Because this is a problem, of course, technology, a technology you do need, you know, electricity at the very least. So, uh, clearly, in Haiti, we have a very dysfunctional a school system. Let's look at teachers. This was a study conducted by the person who is now number two in the Minister of Education in rural schools not too far from Port-au-Prince. And notice that 15% of teachers had not completed, had completed primary school only. Only 30% had completed nine years of secondary school. Uh, the salary, 25, in the school I showed you before, it's $50, $2 a day, uh, which is, you know, bare minimum wage. So what kind of teachers can you get for $2 a day? Uh, teachers who have not completed, uh, many of whom have not completed secondary education. So clearly, uh, the Haitian school system is dysfunctional and uh, cannot obviously take, take on the task of providing education. It's interesting to look now at the literacy and uh, what the uh, Asian government is very good at is to create institutions. Notice that in the field of, of uh, literacy, there are about a dozen different institutions that were created. Uh, the most recent one was the Secretariat for uh, for literacy, and I will <coughs> talk about one of these under the Duvalier regime, which is ONAC, which is the National Office of Literacy and Community uh, Action, and in, you see the uh, UNESCO evaluation. First of all, notice that their rate of success is only about 38 percent by their own statistics, and what, of course, is a problem, a lack of transparency and corruption. Now, this speaks for itself of the effectiveness of the government programs in literacy. And there's a new one. Uh, the uh, Cuban and the Venezuelan governments, much better than 
our own representative of USAID, have realized that to win the hearts of people, you should provide the means to read literacy. And they have uh, launched a program which in Spanish says, Si Puedo, which is We Moins Capable, I put in the pa, because I will, as you will see, <laughs> the program went nowhere uh, with the, uh, und under the tutelage of the Haitian government. There were, in 2007, with support from Cuba and Venezuela, it was decided that three million Haitians would be taught to read and write. And it was a very good program using um, audiovisuals and over 22 months, 75,000 centers, only 40 uh, learners per center. Originally 186 million, only 7.7 .7 were granted eventually. And notice three years later what the person in charge of that institution said that only 4% of the funds were provided and instead of 3 million, only maybe 100,000 uh, were trained. And notice that 0.0001% of the budget of education uh, was provided for literacy, so what can you get? So literacy training is a total disaster in Haiti. Now let's look at um, primary basic education. You, you could see why this is oui, moins pas capable, not <laughs> moins capable. Now, in 1979, with support from the World Bank to the tune of $150 million, most of which went to build schools, which means that you could siphon off money more easily than for other things, uh, the Haitian government decided to launch a campaign uh, in which for transitional bilingualism, in which in the first four years, uh, children would be taught to read and write in Creole, French taught as spoken oral language. The second cycle, two years, French is introduced as a written language and language of instruction. And then three more years, more instruction in French over a cycle of nine years, which is a basic formal cycle. What is interesting is, prior to that, the Ford Foundation supported a program, uh, which is an experimental program, and notice that the results were very optimistic. Notice that uh, there's the children who were taught in Creole, the experimental group, and notice that in terms of a uh, socioeconomic level, the control group, the parents uh, were more educated and uh, were higher socioeconomic level. Yet, in reading, they read much better in Creole and no difference, significant difference in French. But what is most significant in content, in the case math, the children taught in Creole learn much better than peers whose parents were better educated and at a higher social level. So it showed that well conducted, because this was undertaken by, uh, the consultant was uh, Richard Tucker, a noted American applied linguist, under good conditions, uh, the new program could be successful. And uh, in 1979, we organized a symposium in Port au Prince in which we showed that five religious groups were using Creole, and we looked at the retention dropout, and noticed that the retention is very good for 80, 60 percent. If you take this cohort, notice it starts 182, and it ends 109, which is 60 percent, and that this is well accepted by the population because each succeeding year, you're getting more parents who enroll the students in this program. And if you look at the government-run education reform, notice that the traditional, where they use French, uh, had a dropout rate of only 4-3%, but the reform was a total disaster with a 69% dropout rate. And furthermore, if you look at learning in the government program, 
notice that in French, the reform group and the traditional group were not different. What this tells you is that the traditional, whether they use French, they don't learn very much French anyway. <laughs> and not anymore where, they, where French is being postponed. But in math, the traditional group was doing better than the reform group, and in general studies, even more so. So whereas the experimental group well conducted showed that the use of Creole as language instruction was better than the use of French, in the government program, poorly implemented, poorly run, it was a contrary. So the education reform instituted in 79 uh, was very poorly implemented, and uh, generally, many schools do not adapt it at all, and uh, unfortunately, the government simply did not plan it well enough, because if it had, it, it could have been successful. Of course, the minister was fired, and you know, he said uh, in, the, in opening the, the symposium we organized, he says he knew, he, he knows that you know, parents are very sensitive about the future of their children, and he recognizes that the elite you know, should be concerned with the fact that uh, Korea was being introduced, but he said, these families must realize that there are other than their children. That is the 90% of the population and not the 10%. So reform was not for these 10% who have no problem because they acquire French in this, at home and they go to private school, the good private schools where they acquire knowledge and the uh, competence in French. So where do we go? Some hope. Well, some hope is that the government has instituted tests the sixth year and the ninth year, it's called a certificat. However, uh, language skills are tested in Creole and in French, but when you go to content, unfortunately, it is tested only in French, which means that, and presumably taught primarily in French, which means that uh, children don't acquire it. So that's the problem. So what needs to be done is to have these uh, to move to, uh, to use Creole in assessing uh, knowledge in the content uh, domain. And the French uh, have decided to improve the teaching of French because, because Creole is the vernacular language. The French spoken by the elite is much more formal, more bookish than the one in other French-speaking countries, France, uh, Quebec, and so forth. So what they've done is to show that spoken French is not that different, is not as different from Creole as written formal French. For example, in yes, no questions, uh, notice that uh, Asian elite, they, they are, the children are taught inversion. Well, in France, you don't. Uh, it's just like Creole. Céline est content, Céline is happy. Uh, same structure in French, in vernacular French and Creole. For uh, WH questions, uh, instead of inversion, French, uh, Creole, qui côté ou parler? Well, this is just like Creole. Où tu vas? Or if you want a little bit better, où est-ce que tu vas? For future, as we know, uh, you don't have to use the inflected future. Uh, in French, you could use the, uh, the structure, which is actually the same. The quote ava is based on the French verb aller va. And the modal verb, uh, notice that again, uh, vernacular French and Creole similar. So, what this group, which is headed by Robert Chenonçon, a leading Creolist, uh, is trying to do is to try to improve the teaching of French to show, don't show what is so different from Creole, but look at similarities and perhaps. This way, children will acquire a better proficiency in French. Going forward, well, what needs to be done in Haiti is to have a link between adult literacy and fundamental education, particularly in the countryside. There's no sense having 75,000 Center for Literacy and, uh, and to have 
these schools, 20% of which are the same as those I showed you with uh, the thatch roof and so forth. So you should have literacy, uh, use schools as literacy centers. And then, of course, you could train teachers, uh, perhaps in the evening, to do literacy. Better, and, of course, better train teachers, which, of course, is the uh, next uh, step to improve education, uh, teacher training, rigorous evaluation, of course, uh, test con content in Creole as well as French, extend the use of Creole as language of instruction. As it is today, many university students uh, in Haiti do not have sufficient competence in French, so they have to teach them remedial skills at the university level because the teaching of French uh, is ineffective and also uh, it, it, it should be improved and, and presented under better condition. And also Creole should be extended uh, beyond the first four years uh, because it, under the Haitian conditions, it's very difficult to acquire content, the use of French only. So that's what needs to be done. And of course, to improve the teaching of French. Also, what needs to be done, and this is where uh, you have to go back to the clause of the Constitution, which says uh, not necessarily using, creating a Creole Academy on the basis of a French Academy, but to have a government, have institutions involved in updating Creole to make it more suitable and uh, to meet the needs of the 21st century in terms of vocabulary um, in, uh, extension and so forth, and of course, uh, to use Creole as the Constitution specifies uh, in official functions. And of course, uh, we need to have a codification. There is no monolingual dictionary uh, today of Creole. There are no school dictionary. There is no bilingual French Creole, Creole French dictionary of any level at all. And uh, no, of course, grammar. So uh, if you want to be using Creole as a primary language, you should talk about its structure. And uh, you should have textbooks, grammars that show you how Creole differs, its structure differs from French. That is a proper language, proper grammar. So a lot, uh, not necessarily an academy, but government institutions that fulfill this function. And finally, uh, to uh, another Haitian proverb to, to end this presentation. Zafé cabrit, c'est pas zafé mouton. The business of the goat is not that of the sheep. What that means, the problem of Haiti is that the cabrit are the outside world, other governments, France, Canada, uh, the US, the UN. Uh, you know, it's, Haiti is a business of Haitians. And Haitians, somehow, something has to be done to cease the dependence of Haiti on others. Notice that most of these uh, events and pro uh, uh, programs in education were initiated from the outside. The World Bank, this uh, education reform program, literacy program, Cuba, and Venezuela. So Zafi Cabrit, the Haitians somehow, somehow must take control of the destiny in improving education so that their children, uh, so that the use of Creole is extended so you can acquire all content through it, there are more books written, and so that they have the opportunity, the possibility to acquire what is now the privilege of the elite and acquisition of competence in French. And as we say in Creole, Merci en pile. Thank you very much. Yeah, hi there. Uh, a question about you. You're, you're encouraging more use of Haitian Creole in the education system for teaching subject matters. So. You're going to need books in, in these languages. You're going to need materials in, in Haitian Creole. 
I was looking up the Wikipedia, it took me a while to find it for Creole uh, Haitien, put an A in the front. Uh, 53,000 articles in the Wikipedia in Haitian Creole? Is that true? Well, there's a lot of material written in the Haitian Creole. Uh, the question is uh, whether there is school material written in Creole. There is. Uh, the problem is uh, most children cannot afford to buy it, so uh, education, the Constitution of Haiti stipulates that education should be, is obligatory and free. Obviously, that is not the case. Uh, most parents cannot afford to send. One of the reasons that you have such low uh, school attendance is because parents cannot afford even the minimal tuition. So the problem of Creole, Creole is used extensively now more and more, but uh, it is not, since you have 50% of the population that is illiterate, they don't have access to it, and of course children do not get sufficient schooling. And also, the, uh, there is material, but it is not affordable for the average, uh, so that is a problem. In terms of affordability, does the information revolution technology, does this have any impact? I mean, cell phones, are they using cell phones? Is there internet coverage in the major centers? Well, what is uh, striking about Haiti is that they skipped uh, once stage in our development, they don't have fixed line. However, they do have cell phones, which are, you could buy a cell phone for $25. And we were doing uh, uh, field work in the countryside three years ago, and I was in an area where there's no electricity, no water. There was a man selling Digicel, which is the uh, cell phones. So uh, in a sense, what I think that uh, maybe we should not depend on schools as much as we do now, but on new technology. So in a sense, you could skip a stage you know, in our own development and then use cell phones. But again, uh, even when you uh, make uh, $50 a month, uh, even a $25 cell phone, and then of course to keep it up is very expensive. Here's the problem, of course, uh, is to provide these tools. Uh, and uh, there is the uh, Inter-American Development Bank uh, is launching a $4 billion 10-year program to improve education in which education will become free. Now, you could see the problem if 50% of Haitian schools are run for profit. Do you think that these, how uh, these, the owners of these schools, <laughs> you know, how do they see that? So this is a problem that has to be, be solved. So there is, um, I should also point out in terms of the uh, texts which are available, there is no, there's only one periodical in Haitian Creole, which is a monthly uh, Bonne Nouvelle of uh, about 30,000 copies. 50% of the content is religious because it is published by a Catholic group. So there is no daily newspaper in Creole. Uh, there is, of course, radio, as, you, as I pointed out. So what needs to be done, of course, is to increase uh, not the use of Creole by the elite, but to have, to provide people who are taught to read to provide something they can read, for example, uh, newspapers. Although uh, it's true that today people are less dependent on the written word as they were, say, 50 years ago. Uh, and the use of the media and new technology could be very helpful. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, um, it seems like one of the main problems uh, seems to be that uh, most people are really invested ideologically in the issue of language, both people uh, from uh, lower classes or, or non don't have the economic mediums, um, and people of high classes. Um, how is this issue being addressed right now? In, a, in Haiti, how, how people, seems if they're so invested, and, and this is definitely, a, Creole has been used by the government and the official institutions to acquire votes, to, to keep themselves in power. What are, is there anything uh, being done on, on, 
on people addressing, well, we have to demythify the role of language uh, in order to, to, to keep going? I, I don't quite Understand. see clearly the question that is, what needs to be done? If, 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 if there is any, anyone in the country trying to demythify the role of language, um, if people, I mean, if, if, if people that don't have the education believe that Creole is their language, however, Creole is being dismissed as the de facto uh, language, official language, well, there is a problem there. And if there are people, what, are the, what is the reception, uh, the popular reception when people hear, well, we should perhaps address more critically the role of language, of Creole language and of French language? Right, well, what needs to be done if you're going to raise the status of Creole, there already is a standard norm. There's a writing system which is officialized. What you need to do now is to use Creole in all official uh, acts of the government. That is, the laws should be in Creole, uh, a courts should be in Creole, this is not yet done. So what you need to do now, you need to implement the clause of the Constitution which says that all government uh, business, including international treaties, should be done in Creole. This, so in a sense, you have to go from du jure, official use of uh, status of Creole, to actual uh, use, so that needs to be done. Furthermore, what you need to do, you need to have a dictionary, uh, just as there are French dictionaries, then there should be uh, a Haitian dictionary. A child should have a, a school dictionary, which, of course, uh, in which way they can learn the meaning of new words. There is a Haitian uh, French, a Haitian French dictionary, which is very, very, uh, unsatisfactory. It's a, uh, a French dictionary, it's a chat junior for French middle schools. They added a few uh, Creole words, but that doesn't do it. But you need to show Creole is a real language. Look, there's a dictionary. Creole is a real language. Look, there are grammar books, just as our grammars in French. So that needs to be done. And there is no government institution that is doing it. Those that are doing it, notice that the choice of a norm was not the government's choice. It was a private and a religious groups. Um, I was just wondering, um, given the amount of rebuilding that has to be done in Haiti after the recent earthquake, I was wondering um, if you think that will be helpful or detrimental to efforts to you know, raise the status of Haitian Creole and education reform, whether that will be whether it might go faster or slower? Well, uh, uh, clearly, uh, a lot of, first thing you have to do, of course, is to be sure that the million people who live in tent have more secure housing. You also have to uh, rebuild schools and build new schools. And also, at the same time, uh, you have to make it possible for children to learn. And therefore, they can only learn uh, since they, French is not at all, as I've pointed out, French is si simply not accessible, not available in the countryside or even in the city slums. So what you need to do uh, is to be sure that a child acquires basic knowledge in his language. S as a second step, to, to be sure that a child has an opportunity to acquire the language which is today the privilege of the elite. As I point out, there are different problems, a, sc a school system which is inadequate, untrained teachers, so a lot of resources need to go to do that as you rebuild Haiti at the same time. Um, I'm just wondering, um, would it be possibly be easier if you just, if they just decided to teach French and not exact, I mean, not really I mean, kids can learn languages really, really quickly when they're really young. I figure it might be easier if they focused all of their money and attention on just teaching French to really young kids. That way they wouldn't have to create, like, I don't know how developed Creole is 
in like science and math, you mentioned that all those tests are in French. Like the textbooks and all, all that stuff is already there in French. It seems like you're trying, I mean, it might be hard to advance Creole, advance kids' knowledge of Creole and all those subjects, and then also reteach that all in French. It seems like that might be harder than just teaching French from a young age. But notice, they've been doing this uh, for, well, not two centuries, but ever since uh, schooling was instituted, it was done in French. Uh, if Haiti had the resources to do that, you know, if you're going to have French used exclusively and say, okay, Creole is a language at home, uh, you know, French is a language that you need because it's a language of social uh, promotion, uh, the problem is, who is going to teach it? You do not have a teaching force. Uh, if I've observed, uh, we did a, a study in uh, 1981-82 uh, as they were launching a reform uh, of what, what is a traditional schooling done in French. Well, the teachers, uh, is, this is a good parochial school uh, where they were attaining these high retention rates when they're using Creole, but good schools, but the teachers did not have a knowledge of French sufficient to teach basic science. And this is a good school, not that not, this is a a urban school. So you see the problem in Haiti is it's easier to teach Creole since the, m most of the teachers who practice today the, the language they know. If you observe traditional schooling, you see teachers going back and forth in French and Creole. So that would be fine if the country had the proper schools and the proper teaching uh, force, uh, materials which are suitable and uh, for the Haitian context, which does not exist. So the other alternative, uh, I think the education reform is, if well implemented, uh, as we've seen, could be successful. You have to train the teachers, you have to provide materials. What they fail to do is to have massive experimentation. Notice that experimentation was only one class. It was not sufficient, they should have for two years uh, about a hundred different schools under different conditions try it out and see what are the problems and then to solve these and then to generalize the problem that they, which of course you could blame the World Bank because they were the ones who funded this, did not make sure that this reform was implemented. Conclusion is using Creole is a disaster. I mean that was a conclusion people drew and therefore they no longer decide what we're going to do what we did before to try to teach in French. We have one more question. Uh, hello. Uh, how do you suppose Western organizations such as the United Nations would hold uh, the Haitian government accountable for upholding their constitution without imposing on their sovereignty? Well, <laughs> as I said, uh, you know, you cannot, one of the problems is that for example, uh, is external uh, institutions, including the UN, are in charge of what the government should do. For example, the stabilization force is doing a police action. Well, uh, what should be, and they've been there for 10 years. Eventually, what needs to be done is to train the Haitian police to do that. So uh, you cannot expect to have, I mean, uh, you could see that the average Haitian is not very happy with people on the outside telling them what to do. On the other hand, of course, the government is totally dysfunctional. So this is a dilemma that I think that Haitians and, of course, those who are sympathetic to Haiti face. How uh, do you get a government that has a, uh, such a poor record uh, to do what needs to be done in the rebuilding? It's not, uh, it's rebuilding anew. It's not really reconstructing Haiti, but it's building new institutions which are different from those that shown to, be, to, to have failed. And of course, that, that is a question, that is a problem.